welcome to the SaaS Revolution show, uh, Wes Bush. Uh, welcome, Wes. Thanks for having me. I guess I should say Wes Bush, Wes Bush uh, author of uh, the product-led growth uh, book, the world-renowned product-led growth book. <laughs> Yes, thanks. It's actually kind of crazy how many people have been picking up the book. It always just shocks me. I think SaaS is ready as a whole industry just for change. So it's great to see more people thinking about product-led growth. Yeah, no, amazing. Yeah, definitely. I would say like 2019 was the year of like product-led growth and it may be, you know, continuing, you know, into, uh, into 2020. But I guess before we get into product-led growth and, and perhaps even, even the book, to, like, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, who is Wes Bush? Why do you like uh, post-it notes or sticky notes? Do you call it sticky <laughs> notes or what, what? What do you call them? Uh, in, I call in, them post-it uh, notes. Post-it yeah. notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, just a little bit about you as a person and, and how you came into uh, uh, being uh, like a, a PLG uh, kind of you know fan and, and, and expert. Awesome. Yeah. So first off, oh, I just love post-it notes. Don't know about it. <laughs> why? But <laughs> really good for mapping out your ideas. Uh, but a little bit about me. So I have this weird obsession with demand generation. I think it's this fascinating field and the whole process of creating demand for new products to me is so cool. And back about 10 years ago, I was really just trying to figure out how to sell services at this point. And so it was actually with uh, my parents' real estate business where we were figuring out, okay, Google AdWords was really just gaining some steam. And so we started putting together these campaigns. We got a couple of these clients turning into customers for the real estate business. And that for me was the coolest thing because I could see that if you could generate demand for that business, you could generate demand for any business. And so that really got me hooked on this whole process of how can you build these businesses? And so it really got me into the field of demand generation, digital marketing for other B2B SaaS companies. But it wasn't until I was at Vidyard where we launched a free product, which really just took off. We had hundreds of thousands of users using it very quickly. And I really just changed my mind and perspective on the product because up until that point, the product was something you just sold. Whereas in this case, the product was actually part of the customer acquisition model. And so once I, I could see that, it really just got me so much more excited about product. And so I kind of fell into the world of product because I saw it as it's really this powerful way to build a relationship with your customer faster because when they start using your product they're and experiencing the value your product provides, they're building trust with that product, product experience, and they're oftentimes willing to pay or at least pull out their credit card and pay you without even talking to you, which I think is pretty crazy. What inspired you? So you, 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 that, that excitement came about uh, when you were launching this free product at, at Vidyard. Uh, then what inspired you then to kind of make this leap to to write the book, uh, you know, and uh, I guess kind of, uh, I'm, I'm, if I'm correct, you, you're no longer at Vidyard, but you're, you're now kind of focused on obviously your, your, your own initiatives. And if you can give some insights uh, as, as to, to what those are. Yeah, so I feel like there's two parties who might consider writing a book. Both of them are crazy. There's the, the one side who's like, they've been doing this for a incredibly long time. They have so much uh, expert insights into it. And then they usually end up drafting these very complicated books that kind of run more like a manual. And then there's the other side of the spectrum, which is someone who just wants to understand a topic better. And so that was my case. I had built a course on product-led growth, but I realized, I was like, I am just scraping the surface here. There is so much more about product-led growth that I don't even know. So I started building this book on really just like, how could I create my own playbook? Because I was consulting with clients and really just noticing that there is specific patterns to a successful product-led business. I mean, there are certain rules in any business. I, I like to look at it from like a first principles perspective, like for instance, like reducing friction. Like it's something like in your onboarding experience, if you eliminate this and can get your user to a quicker time to value, you will see your paid conversion rate go up. It's just, it always will work. And so I really just want to understand like what are those consistent patterns and what else do I not know about product like growth? So that's why I wrote the book 
And why I see a lot of people using it as like a how-to guide to really make a product-led business work. Amazing. And, and so um, let, let's then uh, just talk about like what is like product-led growth, right? So for those that haven't read the book or uh, those that are perhaps not as like obsessive as like, you know, myself or you or, or uh, but I'm assuming most are, are, are running or in SaaS companies, uh, talk to us a little bit about what, what, it, what it is and, and I guess what it means sort of like right now in 2020. Definitely. So I see product-led growth as a go-to market strategy where you're using your product as the main vehicle to not just acquire, but also activate and retain your customers. So if you look at your typical, like, I mean, remote products right now are really popular with everything going around the virus. So like, look at your Zoom, like they are acquiring hundreds, no, actually probably close to hundreds of millions right now, but people who are just going through, signing up for the product, getting value from the product without talking to anyone in the sales. So that's the product doing the majority of that heavy lifting. Sure, there's room for sales and everything else, but it's just front loaded with the product experience. And then sure, sales can come in and say, hey, there's like 100 users here from this one company. Let's make sure that this sales experience for them is even better. And so it's really kind of changing the way you sell your product because it does, that first experience usually does start with the product. Have you seen, uh, I mean, obviously like Zoom is obviously a great, a great example there that, that you've called out. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I read uh, yesterday that they've jumped from like 10 million daily users in December to 200 million daily users now, um, you know, which is, uh, is kind of incredible. And as I say, like you, you've got, you, you know, your, your grannies and grandpas and like all kind of different people like using Zoom. Uh, but having the ability to kind of like sign up and use it and not perhaps not being the most kind of like technical. So just kind of showing the ease of use and you say uh, like the lack of friction right. to kind of sign up uh, to the, those, those, those problems and, and solving a, a great kind of use case. But from uh, if we look at like there's marketing led companies and there's sales led companies and then there's product led companies uh, like as, as well. Like when you, you know, or do you think if you're a sales led company, you, you know, how and why should you kind of switch from being this sales led to product led? You know, can you, if you're already a sales led organization? So it really depends on who your customer is. So if your customer is, is um, like really big enterprises, sales led might still be the best fit for you. I'm not trying to tell people like product led is just for, for everyone, like for your specific business, you need to consider who your customer is, how they like to buy at the end of the day. But what we're realizing is that majority of people really do prefer, even in the enterprise, to have that try before you buy experience. And I've worked at companies where there's multi-million dollar deals. And one thing they ask for before they usually sign is still that trial experience because they want to see it before they actually pull out the big checkbook and pay for that. And so it's really common for the enterprise now to consider this and actually want to see the product. And especially right now in a crisis like this, where people are uh, holding on to their money more, they want to really understand the product if it will be the best option for them before making that purchase because they're risk averse. And when people are risk averse, it just makes it a lot easier for people to make a purchase when they have already seen the value of it. So product-led companies like Zoom in this case are doing it a fantastic job because they can prove the value very quickly and make a no-brainer purchase decision for the buyer. Yeah, so you sort of led, led into actually my next question around like, you, you know, times like these we're going, you know, we're kind of like the... the uh, whether it is the peak of the coronavirus, uh, you, you know, or not, but we have a global pandemic. Uh, everybody is working from home. We're all in lockdown. Um, you, you know, and uh, there are businesses of, of of all shapes and sizes and uh, different services that, that that are suffering, right? And then within within SaaS uh, as well, we see some that are thriving. And you mentioned like uh, Zoom. Uh, like being one of the uh, uh, one of them, I, I can't remember actually. There was another one I was uh, thinking about today that has uh, been doing really well, but maybe it'll it'll, it'll come back to me. Uh, but also, there's going to be some SaaS companies that will be suffering, and um, you know, perhaps these are also maybe like seen as the the non essentials, where whereby a lot of companies they're looking at you know cutting their costs. They look at their subscriptions, they're like what are the platforms that are not core or key to us, and they kind of cut those costs. Um, uh, but perhaps there are, there are uh, you know, uh, many that are not, let's say, like product-led growth companies 
uh, as well uh, that uh, because of their the traditional way of like maybe doing business uh, is creating this kind of barrier. So you talked about the risk averse uh, side of things, which is definitely it's true right now. Mm-hmm. People are being more risk averse. Like what are what are what other kind of like advantages or, or disadvantages you know are there around sort of being product led like in times like these, and why should companies you know if they should be a product led company in times like these? Yeah, so one thing working for it is when businesses are hurting, people are looking for ways to spend less. So that is also meaning that people are looking to switch products. If they're paying a lot for a specific product, maybe it's another SaaS tool, and they find one that's a lot cheaper, more affordable, does the same thing or something similar, they're more willing to actually switch at this time, which is a great thing for product-led businesses because what you're typically going to see is if you're a sales-led or even a marketing-led company, it's really expensive for you to sell a product. And so you're passing that expensive sales process, that premium price is going towards the customer. And that's not necessarily because the product is more valuable. It's because it's expensive to sell. And so that's what a lot of people are looking for. They're like, hey, is there cheaper alternatives here that I can still get the same thing done? And a lot of product-led companies are for the most part, more affordable because they have a better customer acquisition model. When they use the product as that first touch point, they're saving tons of costs. And if you look at even just Zoom and this whole example, since you mentioned it earlier, going from 10 million daily active users to 200 million, imagine how much they'd have to spend on a sales team to, to onboard that volume of people. Like you just can't do that. There is no possible way you could onboard that many sales reps for that specific period of time in that short period of time. So it's really kind of interesting. The other, I guess, downside potentially for product like companies at this point is a lot of them have SMB clients or customers. And so the small business sector has actually got hit a lot harder. And you typically will see that the SMBs, the churn rates are higher. And so that is something that is definitely a little bit harder for these product like companies to tackle. But there is a lot of other bigger enterprise companies that are moving down and saying, hey, what are those other alternatives that we could use? And so it's a really interesting balancing act that you can see some SaaS companies, like you're mentioning, just thriving in this environment, whereas some other non-essential SaaS tools are definitely hurting at the end of the day. There's no denying that. Uh, I, I remember the, the, the other case uh, that I was speaking about from the SaaS companies or, or even a type of SaaS company that's thriving, uh, and it's electronic signature. Um, and so somebody was talking about uh, this e-signature company in uh, in Spain, a signature it that was uh, you know actually just seeing a real boost and up upturn uh, in in their their their, their company and their, their their offerings and people kind of taking up e-signature uh, in this moment, right? So um, so uh, that, that 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 was super interesting. And, and there's like low friction. I think like any you sign up for a DocuSign or Hello Sign or a signature it or whatever. It's so easy yeah. to kind of use and get going with, right? So it's probably a, a, a case in point there. And when you were talking about, obviously, uh, like uh, your own personal experience like with Vidyard, and uh, I guess they were, would you say they were sales-led before they launched this kind of uh, freemium tool? Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so they, they were like a sales-led company that then, you, you know, brought in uh, and you were leading this like uh, freemium kind of initiative and making that transition. So uh, that's kind of one way of uh, perhaps becoming a bit more, you, you know, sort of uh, product led. Uh, but if, if, if a company is sales led or marketing led at the moment and they're not, you know, product led, what advice would you give to them to kind of, you know, looking to get going? Is it just about, you know, try a freemium product or, or, or what else? Yeah, so it really depends how many products you have as a company. So at Vidyard, we had multiple products and we launched this premium product is really a test proof of concept to see like if this premium model could really work. If you look at HubSpot, same kind of deal. They had multiple products. They launched uh, HubSpot sales, which was called Sidekick at that time when they first launched it. And so they, they built out that go-to-market model for that specific product. And then they eventually integrated it and rolled it out to the rest of the business. And so if you're multi-product, I'd start small, start with the new product. Because it's going to be a lot easier to build that internal team or tagger team, if you will, for focusing on that specific product to test it out. And then when you get some of those quick wins under your belt, it's going to be a lot easier to build that internal business case to get everyone on the board of seriously considering rolling this out. Because 
in a company that's making that transition from sales led to product led, it is a totally different way of selling because instead of going through your traditional demo request process and then it gets past the SDR, then account executive, like we, we all know how that system works, but making that transition to product led and what metrics you should even be watching is really uh, gonna be a learning act for every business. So if you're multi-product, start small, start with a new product. However, if you're not a multi-product company, what I would really try and get you to think about is what is the one thing you could do even today to start small. And so what I recommend doing is simply changing your call to action from demo request to free trial or request a free trial for about 2%, even 1% if you got a lot of traffic on your website, just show it to two to 1% of everyone who comes to your website. And then you, you can start doing is actually onboarding people as you go through that first call together. And so you can walk them through what they need to do to set up an account. And what that's gonna train you to do is understand what someone has to do in your product to see value. And then what I like to do at that point is you're gonna understand like there's a very specific number of steps it takes for someone to see value in your product. And I just map it all out. And then you can start to get very creative around, maybe there's something in the product we could do to guide people. Maybe it's a tool tip. Onboarding tool tips are super easy to roll out nowadays where we just guide people through each of those steps so they can get to that point where they experience the value of your product. So that's really the two different ways. If you're multi-product, start with potentially launching a new product. If you're not a multi-product, start small. Start with that one or 2% of your website traffic, get the wheels moving, have someone dedicated towards doing those onboarding calls, and then you're gonna learn very quickly what is required for someone to see value in your product. I want to switch gears a little bit because, I mean, apart from obviously uh, you, your, your knowledge around product-led growth and, you, you know, uh, the book, you, you also uh, ran, uh, you know, the, the Product-Led Growth Summit, right? Uh, is that, that's the name of it, right? Product-Led Growth Summit? Uh, just the product led summit, but yep. Product led summit, um, and uh, and so I guess like uh, and this was before. I mean, now obviously online summits, virtual conferences, are are booming out of necessity, right? It, it, it's not necessarily that they're the cool thing to do. It's people don't have any other option. Uh, but given that you you've kind of you've done uh, and ran uh, you know a virtual conference, what's um, you, you know tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I, I guess kind of why you did it. Uh, what was your experience and what is your advice for, for those that are listening? Because uh, like I'm getting a lot of SaaS companies sort of reach out to me and saying, look, you know, we have to cancel our user conference. So we're going online, uh, you know, and create a virtual conference. What advice can I give them? But I've never done it before. And I'm, I'm, figu I'm figuring this out myself. Right. So I'm actually curious to kind of learn from, from you here. And I'm sure the audience are as well. Definitely. So the, the first reason, although it's probably not too relevant to your kind of situation, like why I started the Product Led Summit is because before to really learn a lot about Product Led Growth, and I still do this, is I consistently do a lot of calls, even just like this, where you talk to people, learn like how they approach specific things for the problems you're trying to tackle at that time. And I was doing all these calls without anything to really give back to these speakers. And so I just wanted to build a platform where it's like, hey, we could still have this same conversation, but I'm going to provide a ton of value to you through this online virtual summit. So that's what I did is really just understanding how practitioners dissect and really approach product-led growth at their company. And so the second part of your question, like what to do to really make a product-led summit work. So I have run four virtual summits so far. And the thing I'm, I'm always trying to figure out is just like, how do you balance um, engagement for these events and really get people excited? Because that is one thing that I still tell even any partner that's wanting to partner on this summit, like it's not the same. It's never going to be the same as a physical event. You just can't compare them together. But I think the role of a virtual summit and a physical event is totally different. Like I, when I went to SaaS talk, for instance, I didn't necessarily go with the intention of like, I'm going to learn all of these specific things. It was more so like, I have so many incredible friends and SaaS leaders who I just want to meet. And so like the physical event, it dominates. It will always dominate for that one-on-one -on -one connection, having those meetings. And really that's, that's the beauty of it. But a virtual summit, what I'm seeing again and again is that people are going to them with a very different intention. They want to go there to actually learn. 
And so I try and structure the virtual summit based on how could I create the best possible learning experience here? And so the one thing I would definitely challenge you to think about is like the specific categories of your events. So find out like maybe it's, I don't know, pulling your community or something like that, but find like what are those specific categories they care about and then segment all your talks based on what those specific things are because people want to understand what they, they care about first and then dive in. And the second thing, this one was hilarious. So I got this feedback again and again. So I did a pre-recorded summit. Uh, this was two summits ago. And the most consistent feedback I got from people was, where's the 2X speed? Like, <laughs> it was just like kind of hilarious. It caught me off guard because um, when people are watching these summits, they want to consume content super fast. And I think about the same thing. Like even when I listen to podcasts, I'm like the, the two X person. I just like having quick audio. <laughs> and so people are the same. If it is going to be on demand, make sure you give them that ideal experience. And then in terms of the engagement, try and give them a way where they can connect somewhere else. So maybe that's a Slack group. If you don't have it kind of integrate it into your website yeah. or maybe it's like telling everyone to, to meet in. I know there's a bunch of services now where like you can all meet online. Maybe it's a zoom room or something like that to give them options. Um, you just don't want to give them too many options or else you'll get some people here, some people there, and then yeah. it's not really the best experience, but yeah. How have you thought about approaching that for engagement? Yeah, yeah, it's a, a good question. Um, I mean, so what we we real, realize that that is going to be one of the challenges, but uh, but we've also seen that you you know, I mean, certainly the virtual conferences that I've attended, and it hasn't been like a huge amount to to, to be honest, but like in the past has has often been just a kind of a two way thing, like me and you talking over Zoom, and then there's a stream of chat, you know, kind of on the side and. Uh, the the the, uh, the attendees are not engaging with each other, but more kind of like asking questions, or they might see you know a name that they uh, they, they recognise there. But uh, I don't think the tech was really kind of there. Um, like it was it was nice, but it wasn't quite there really until until now. And now we're seeing like there's a number of platforms where literally you could take the template of the SaaS dot conference, you know, put it on these on these platforms, you know, and have various stages of content. Uh, have breakout sessions, uh, you know, run private kind of roundtables, have segmented networking, you know, and a virtual exhibition uh, uh, as well. So effectively, like almost everything that we do at the online uh, uh, at the physical conference, we can now do online. But it's not going to be quite the same, you know, uh, 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 as you say. I think it's going to be very strong from the uh, from the content side, from the learning side. So we can put on that content. People can watch that from their own homes. They may be a little bit distracted uh, or more distracted than they would be when they're actually you know, in Dublin uh, at the conference. But because here, maybe they're answering emails or jumping onto meetings, but going specifically in, in, into some of their content. But uh, from the engagement side of things, we are thinking very much you know, around the segmentation, around having special uh, kind of networking uh, times, uh, uh, segmented networking rooms. Um, there is like a more kind of serendipitous networking functionality where you can meet with random people and have some sort of like random kind of, you know, virtual coffees and stuff like that. Um, so there, there are ways around the, the engagement and getting people engaged. And we're still learning, like, to be honest, yeah. like how to really kind of optimize this. And we've got 69 days to kind of uh, figure it out with the technology that we've got and to kind of optimize it for people. Um, uh, so it's going to be interesting. So what, we, what we're saying is that look, whilst we can replicate like a lot of what we do in Dublin, it's not going to be exactly the same. Uh, and there's going to be some new things, right? And it's going to be a different experience. Uh, but, you, you know, it will still be the kind of the same essence of SaaS stock. But the things that I guess that we'll miss maybe from the online events, although maybe we'll figure out a way how to do it, is like just, I guess, those serendipitous sort of like bumping into people that you know, yeah. you, you, you know, and uh, having the pints of Guinness in the evening, right? And having the dinners and the, you, you know, the nighttime stuff. Um, but uh, maybe we can have some virtual drinks and uh, everyone can bring a beer or, or whatever, right? Um, uh, stick together. Yeah. But, but, it, but, but you're right. I mean, like going to a conference like Sastock in Dublin, you know, you, you bump into Michael Litt and Steli FD and, you, you know, all of these guys, Nick Franklin, Patrick Campbell, whatever, right? Uh, and they're all there and it's a good time to 
catch up with people kind of old and new. Um, and this will be slightly different. Um, you know, people will be there, but you, you know, those folks will be delivering content and maybe then they're kind of like not necessarily sticking around uh, because they've got businesses to run or, or whatever, but they might stick around for a bit mm -hmm. to kind of have a look at the experience, but uh, it won't be quite the same. So, so I think as well, that's why you position it slightly you know, slightly different, right? And uh, different. Uh, and it's obviously priced differently, and uh, and so on. So uh, it'll be interesting, and I think that you you know we'll see that what's happening at the moment, and people going online uh, or running online events, and shaking up a little bit of the event industry. And we might be running a bit more of a hybrid format, you know, in the future where we have online conferences and we have mm -hmm. physical conferences, um, but perhaps not only, you know, physical uh, uh, events. So I'm quite, you know, it's, it, 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 it's been born out of a crisis for, for us, um, but there's this opportunity and I'm excited about it and the, the, the team is, and I think we can really provide a lot of value, you know, in this moment where, you, you know, people still need that, you know, kind of support and they still want to learn and, they still want to connect with people. So uh, yeah, we're bringing the SaaS value online. So uh, excited for that. But uh, I'm sure I can get a few more tips from you uh, uh, offline after the, uh, uh, after the podcast. For sure. Um, and it's, tell us a little bit about, um, uh, sort of uh, as we wrap up, just a bit about the, the book. Where, where can people uh, go and find the book and where can people find you online? Yeah, so if you want to find out more about the book, you can just go to productledbook.com. And if you want to find more about what I'm up to, uh, just head on over to productled.com. That's probably the best place. There's like a treasure trove of content around product-led growth. There's the access to all those summits we were referencing. And yeah, my, my whole mission here is really just to give people the knowledge and resources to learn how they can build a product-led business. So that's my goal here. And hopefully if you visit the website, you'll learn that too. Amazing, great stuff. Um, uh, final question, uh, I always ask everybody how they stay healthy and sane. Um, uh, like what, what is your way, and especially like maybe uh, bringing it into kind of lockdown, um, you know, how are you staying healthy and sane in this moment? Yeah, so I mean, like with lockdown, it, you have to, for me, it's all about routine. Like I'm a really like routine kind of person. And so I have to work out like first thing in the morning. And so, it has been yeah a little bit harder because like usually i like classes <laughs> and so whenever you don't have that class to go to it's like okay there's a little less pure pressure of like hey you didn't show up so i feel like especially when it's you're in quarantine you have to find some like similar alternative and for me it's just finding like someone on youtube who has like really good classes and you just like have something quick you get moving right away and then eating healthy at the end of the day that's really what it is i like having i don't know if you've ever read the book oh it's gonna i don't know if it's top of mind or not but the power of nope all right i'll think about it and <laughs> it's essentially the whole book is all about managing your energy not your time and so i think that is probably the most powerful thing especially when you're working from home is like you could keep working all the time but are you taking consistent breaks are you yeah. potentially going for a walk are you i don't know switching it up every now and then or else it's easy to just burn out so i feel like those yeah. are the, the main things i'd recommend yeah good advice and i have to say i mean i i've been struggling um like i've been enjoying working from home uh, but the energy levels just like it, like they're, they're, they're not as great now. I mean, I've, in, in part, I've obviously been recovering from ha having the uh, sort of, uh, you know, the coronavirus myself. So there's probably like part of it, uh, but I'm probably not taking enough breaks, um, you, you know, just kind of doing what I need to do. And just by the end of the day, like, you know, my, my head is just, I just feel so much more tired than I usually yeah. do with my three hour commute, you, you know, three hour round trip commute. So, uh, uh, I need to get better at that. Uh, and so people are listening, like, um, uh, listen to Wes, Wes's tips there. I'm going to put you on the spot for, uh, bef uh, before we sort of wrap up. Uh, pull one of those uh, sticky notes uh, off the wall if you're happy to and uh, tell me a little bit about uh, uh, the story behind that. All right. Um, okay, so this one. This is my theme for the year, which is go first class. And so... In product-led growth, like there's so many things and opportunities coming my way where it's, you have to really have that filter 
of if you're going to do something, go first class. So I like having a word for every year. And so that's the word for this year. And so it's a nice reminder. <laughs> Amazing. No, I like that. Uh, I don't have a theme for a year, but we are now doing quarterly themes within the business. But um, awesome. I, I really like that. So thanks for sharing that, uh, uh, Wes. So uh, yeah, let's say uh, Wes Bush, uh, thanks for being a great guest on the, uh, uh, on the SaaS Revolution show today. No worries. Thanks for having me.